George Town is that amazing grid of narrow streets adjacent to the north of Fort St George which during the days of British consolidation was inhabited by the Portuguese, Armenians, Anglo-Indians, Telugus and Tamils. Then called Black Town, it was a locality that housed the residences of those who traded with or provided some service to the British who functioned from within the fort. It was also a locality that had trade specific streets such as for stationers, jewelers, textile merchants, hardware dealers and even coral merchants. Where do you go to buy your birds sometimes? Yeah, I go to Georgetown. Here in school we used to bunk on Saturday and go there. It's a big market. Today, uh, unbelievable, you cannot see so many birds being sold. Been, when, when was the last you visited the place? Oh, two months ago. I bought a game cock and another cock I bought from there by hens. They're quite cheap and healthy. And uh, you can get any, anything you want. I bought turkeys also from there, six turkeys last year. They're yet living with me. In and around Georgetown, you will find the Madras High Court, the General Post Office, the State Bank of India, all housed in Indo-Saracenic buildings, besides the Chennai Port Trust, Custom House, HSBC, Indian Bank, the Reserve Bank of India, the Madras Stock Exchange, and several private companies such as the Murugappa Group, Shaw Wallace, etc. Anglo-Indians found gainful employment in many of these establishments. The secretaries of most of the European firms in their time were Anglo-Indian. Today, secretaries hail from different backgrounds, yet Anglo-Indians are still sought after and one wonders why. We are like all-rounders. We are skillful, we are, uh, our communication excels. So we have, we, know, we have what it takes. We can probably meet a, a client. Our first very our first handshake gives us gives them the thing that we are commanding. We are uh, you know in order. What is the protocol like? I ask her. Uh, I support the senior vice president of operations for Tamil Nadu. So his calendar management is entirely with me. So if he needs to get something done, he needs to meet someone who would just give him a random call. He would say, please contact my secretary. She knows my, uh, the order of my day and probably she'll give you uh, a slot today. If not some other time, whenever I'm free, probably because she knows even when I'm traveling. Are you happy with your job? Presently, yes. Yes, I, I worked for some of the major companies and I've had very nice bosses. Bosses that actually spurred me on, um, made me confident, made me a go-getter, made me approachable. So lots of things that, are, that actually helped me grow in my, in my field. Most secretaries belong to an association called the IASAP. So I have been part of this um, Indian Association for Secretaries and Administrative Professionals. Uh, I've been with them since uh, 2006 and uh, I've also grown because there have been a lot of opportunities for me. They have conducted a lot of training programs uh, like negotiation strategies and you know how to manage vendors and uh, given us a lot of opportunities where we could learn uh, various aspects of life. The association, formerly known as NIPS, and launched at Mumbai by the famous Zelma Lazarus in 1970 has branches all over India and conducts annual competitions to determine its most talented secretaries. And both Diana and Kristen have been runner-up before. Many of course have won the coveted award in the past. We dropped into the Christmas treat held by the IASAP at the E Hotel in Express Avenue and were surprised to find a number of Anglonian secretaries in attendance. The role of secretaries has, however, been diluted in the digital era and youngsters today are moving on. See, when we set up office, we are looking out for Anglo Indian secretaries. I think I have told you and uh, you never caught any of them. Those days you call up, you get a secretary, you get a typist. No, nobody. They are all in a better position. They are in a better jobs. 
we train on the different as managerial aspects so um, right from time management delegation skills uh, assertiveness then we have trainings on communication as well and uh, we have uh, trainings designated for the different levels that enter our organization so even a vp is trained by the team or myself what are the types of uh, hurdles you have had to cross as a woman uh, no doubt because always you're questioned on your capacity and ability um while a man could has only to do work and nothing to balance back at home but for a woman the question is always will you be able to work long hours will you be able to create a balance between home and with of with work and this has always been the question before we can raise rise to the next level we are just about two women in the circle in the board meetings and um but at least we're getting there in georgetown you will also find several churches and anglo indian schools In fact, the first Anglo-Indian settlements in Madras in terms of a purely British connection were in Georgetown. During the 18th century, on account of war and disease, the number of Anglo-Indian orphans in Georgetown was considerable. Those whose fathers were soldiers were cared for by the St Mary's Charity School, which began in 1715 within Fort St George. A few decades later, military orphanages for boys and girls were set up on separate premises at Egmo the children of civilians were looked after by the civil asylums put in place by anglo indians themselves in a couple of houses near st mark's church the female asylum in 1815 and the male asylum in 1823 the initiatives were supported by the european community all these establishments were to later merge in 1872 to form the civil orphan asylum now known as st george's school and orphanage the military orphans especially the european were shifted to the lawrence asylum at lovedale in the nilgiris in georgetown st mark's church built in 1805 still stands today as do a few other churches in the area the old portuguese presence here is not forgotten and these portuguese later on from fort st george they went on to what was uh, Uh, a black town then and is now georgetown so i think they have well, you have a portuguese church in georgetown the assumption church on portuguese street has the oldest lineage in georgetown though its present building is of recent origin we were fascinated by an imposing tree on the church premises and ventured to find out what it was this is what in tamil is called the seema pulyanka palam that is a uh, european tamarind fruit and this comes from this tree behind me with a huge trunk ma konja varigala ma you watch to come in la she's going to break this fruit and show us how it looks inside Just opposite the Portuguese church stands a little doll house belonging to Mrs Wakefield who passed away 2 years ago. The house remains locked and through a vent above the main door one can see a solitary bulb on awaiting silently for a visiting relative from Australia to give it some respite perhaps around Christmas. We step into the house of Keith Rodricks owned by his family for over 60 years. Keith has been quietly active for many years in supporting community members financially during times of bereavement but even this is facing a natural demise in the years we have this jolly christmas time said maybe and they love a rum batch in the afternoon go around to each one's place and each one will have a drink and we used to have a band riding for the children Uh, block cut the santa santa used to dress up and guys with guitars and all this stuff and they go around the streets and at each house they give the present to the children it was fun in those days <laughs> but now everyone has gone there are only anglos now in the street like the cycle rickshaw the anglo indian once ubiquitous 
is now a rarity in Georgetown. Keith's brother Quinton also has a home here on Xavier Street, though he himself is in Melbourne and the house is run down. The house is cared for by Ravi, a cobbler who sits at work in front of the house. <laughs> One of these homes is that of Christopher Anthony, who has spent 50 years in Georgetown and still cherishes the place. The Austro is always very happy. All the people in the town are very, very social and we used to have a lot of fun. But now, now the Andrews have all shifted from it. Only a few of us are here. But still we find that happiness goes from birth to here. Georgetown is a nightmare to negotiate. The roads are narrow, crowds jostle for space, with vehicles in haste, and everybody seems to be in a hurry to get somewhere. For our part, we were pleased to meet a couple of Anglo-Indians on the way. Auto driver Charlie Sequera awaiting his passenger and Margaret Fernandez returning from the market. Many Anglo-Indians have done their schooling in St. Mary's on Armenian Street. Founded in 1839, the school has had a colourful history. My principal was, was very unique. He was Irish and uh, he disciplined me a lot because I was a very rough kid and uh, I used to get in a lot of trouble. But anyway, whatever he has done has proved to be beneficial for me today. Where I am today, I can say it's because of George Patrick White. You know, uh, Father White focused on all the boys individually. He knew where, who the weak boys were and who were the strong boys in, st in, in studies and in sports. And he developed them. You know, he, he knew their potential and he knew what the boy could do and he developed that potential. We've had great athletes, we've, we've had great academicians, we have, we have doctors, you know, who have reached national levels in their fields. I would say that they were also influenced by Father George Patrick White. He was a principal, Irish, and really a gem of a person. Because I remember when we were high East, when we were doing 10th to 11th final year, he was out of country. So he made it a point to write to each one of us, encouraging us to do well in our final exam. And we had uh, about maybe 30, 40 percent of them who were Anglo Indians. And uh, every one of them were talented in some way, be it music or sports. I can, uh, you know, rattle off uh, from memory that in sports there was a guy called Ian Brambleby. He was amazing as a pole vaulter. And then there were the Tilaka brothers, the Michael Tilaka and uh, Kevin Tilaka, and uh, the Duart brothers, Andy Duart and uh, Jerry Duart. So we had a lot of uh, sportsmen who were from the Anglo Indian community. We had a huge presence, Anglo Indian friends, a lot of my friends. Anybody studied with you in Yeah, Edmund brothers, no, the twins of them. Yeah, I mean, from first standard to we did electrical engineering together. Of course, there were times of rivalry in school. We used to have uh, hockey matches or football and all that. So, invariably the match will be Anglo-Indians versus Indians. Finally, the divide will come. So that's how you would organize the teams also? The teams will fall, like, fall into place like that. And uh, me with a neutral name like this. <laughs> and I was not much of a sportsman. So at the end of it, the 10th or 8th, 9th or something, either of them who have less he called me. <laughs> the boys of St. Mary's quite excelled in sports. I loved running. I was a good athlete. I had a lot of good uh, athletes like Claymont, Zoya, David Pell, uh, Russell Nicholas, who was a very, very much our senior, and Virgil D'Souza, and uh, who else? Uh, Bellard. Uh, Bellard. <laughs> we used to call him Karpa. <laughs> who, from which school was your main competitor? Oh, from St. Beads, St. George's, and even Dufton Corley. My cousin actually raced against me. He was from Dufton. Uh, the chunky cousins, the, the boys were all good athletes. They were all from St. Mary's, of course. But the people who competed against me were from other schools. 
I had a guy by name David from St. Beats, and uh, he was he was awesome. But but I still beat him. I believe that boxing was very strong in St. Mary's. Yes, that's true. That's true. But I didn't box because I was a funk. I I used to run. But I had friends like Carlton Daniels, Glenn Daniels, James, Dominic James, Robert James, uh, Dylan Brothers, who all fought very well. Zoya and Rex Claymont was another good boxer. Boxing happened before my time because I used to hear that it was a very regular thing. Because when I joined school as a kid in sixth standard, Father Reverend Father White was the principal, and there was a regular boxing ring there in our school. And boxing was a very popular sport. We used to have it once a year. We used to have fights, and there was a guy by name Ivo Madden, a fantastic boxer. He and Madden was another one, and unfortunately, they are. They are. I think one is in Australia and one is in the in the UK. Indeed. Boxing was very popular with the Anglonian community in Georgetown and Royperham and some of the prominent boxers were Joe Giles, Trevelyan de Souza and Troy Rosario. Some fondly remember being coached by Nat Terry of West Indian origin. Yeah, but, uh, Nat Terry. Nat Terry says that you got a good uh, left man to come. Salt cutters. Ball is staying there, no? Old man ball. Every day, go off in the evening there, practice one hour. Go back, what's this cut here? What's this going right there? All that. Oh, I bring, what? All it means is that. Yeah, stop it. Enough. In later times, Rocky Brass of the Railways won the Tamil Nadu State Championship successively for three years from 1979 to 1981. He had the honour of an exhibition bout with the great pugilist Muhammad Ali during his visit to India in 1980. St. Mary's also produced fine musicians. We had uh, Jerome Peters, we have Stan Peters, then we had uh, Huey, and Theo. Huey and Theo Peters. They were all, uh, you know, they had a band called uh, The Avengers. I remember Theo, Huey Peters, then um, Cuthbert on the drums and uh, Russell Hall on the saxophone. They were a great band. I mean, there were so many bands here. Uh, I can... Uh, <clears throat> there was a very famous band called the Shadooks at that point of time. I don't know how many people remember them. And uh, uh, for me, I... Uh, because I had some interest in music and I used to hang around watching all these uh, senior musicians perform. There was a gentleman called uh, Ernie Peters who was a lovely drummer and his son Noel Peters went on to become a very famous drummer during our time and uh, we had the Watts brothers Warren Watts and Blaze Watts. Blaze Watts was a very close friend of mine and he taught me how to play the guitar and then uh, we had uh, some very good drummers like uh, Johnny Edmonds, uh, Dominic uh, DeMonte. All these people actually inspired me to you know uh, take up percussion seriously because I really loved uh, you know listening to their music and I really want to become a musician. Ajit also remembers the efforts of Father John Peter Satyaraj, who took over the reins of the school once Father White returned to Ireland. He went out of his way. He brought in the music instruments. In fact, those days the electronic organ was a very new thing, you know. So I remember in one of his visits to Italy, he brought back a Fafisa electronic organ. And there were so many Anglo Indian boys who were so talented and they formed the band immediately. St. Mary's has also had a number of Anglonian teachers over the years. Veera Als, I don't know, she, you know, she was my third standard teacher. Very kind and lovely teachers, Mrs. Gear. I am there as the English teacher and there's another Anglonian lady in the third standard or fourth standard. Her name is Ice Hyacinth and just uh, last year Barry, uh, Barrington uh, Rosario, D. Rosario joined us as a music teacher. So we are just three. At St. Mary's? Yes. On campus is the St. Mary's Co-Cathedral, in many ways the successor to the St. Andrew's Church, which was built in Fort St. George by a French Capuchin priest, Father Ephraim de Nevers, in 1642. The Catholic Church in the fort premises was destroyed by the British in 1752 in retribution for the French occupation of the fort during 1746-49. Notwithstanding this, 
It is the St Mary's Church in Fort St George, built in 1680, that bears historical testimony to British rule in Madras. Not only is the church replete with tombstones and sculptures of British soldiers and administrators, but within its records, one can find interesting details pertaining to personalities like Elihu Yale and Robert Clive, who married Margaret Maskelyne, an Anglo-Indian. One must not forget that due to their paucity of number and lack of their lady folk, the British had, for over a hundred years, officially encouraged intermarriage with Indian women. That policy was to change in the 1780s, by which time the Anglo-Indians greatly outnumbered the British in India, and the British became circumspect, to say the least, thanks to events in the Americas, where the mulattoes, a mixed race community, were instrumental in ejecting the Europeans from Haiti, San Domingo, and in some ways even Britain from the United States of America. A series of orders were passed by the directors of the East India Company, subjecting Anglo-Indians to the severest of disabilities. Anglo-Indian identity as a distinct community really grew during the early decades of the 19th century. Some of the restrictions were lifted after 1857, and Anglo-Indians were entrusted with manning the railways, post and telegraphs, customs and ports across the country. Their services were also utilized in the police and defense forces. Anglo-Indians were enlisted in large number to fight or render service in the two world wars. Some, such as Guy Gibson of Dam Buster's fame, were awarded Victoria Crosses, being treated as British nationals. Many fought in the Indian Armed Forces after independence and have won the Veer Chakra, apart from other titles. But enough of this detour. Here at St. Mary's Church, Armistice Day is observed every November with great solemnity. Maria Nirmal Kumar, nay Wilkins, whose son is a captain in the Indian Army, volunteers every year, coordinating with the church pastor to ensure that the service is conducted in an impeccable manner. Representatives from the diplomatic corps as well as the three branches of the armed services are always present and it was heartwarming to witness Group Captain Aaron Hurtis, an Anglo-Indian from Kanano in Kerala, representing the Indian Air Force. As far as the co cathedral on Armenian Street is concerned, its prominence today comes more from the devotion to St. Anthony, whose statue on the eastern transept of the church is a big draw with pilgrims, particularly on Tuesdays. Anglo-Indians would meet fellow community members here, often in the past, rarely nowadays. The Armenian street itself is named after the famous 305-year-old Armenian church standing to the left of St. Mary's Co-Cathedral. In fact, the Armenian presence in Madras goes back to the 1660s when some of the earliest traders had come to the city. Several Armenian merchants lived on the street. Over time, many persons of Armenian descent were absorbed into the Anglonian fold. Names like Satur, Johannes and Arathun are typical Armenian. There appear to be no Armenians left in Madras, which is a huge loss to the city and the erstwhile caretaker of the Armenian church, Trevor Alexander, was in fact an Anglo-Indian. His successor, Jude Johnson, too, is an Anglo. Standing cheek by jowl to the right of St. Mary's is the St. Columban School for Girls. St. Columban's was started by a lay person called Mrs. Smith, who had come from Trichy, and she started set up the school with around eight students. And uh, as the numbers started to grow, she found it very difficult to manage the school and so she approached Bishop Fennelly. Bishop Fennelly then contacted Mother Mary Curran in Ireland, that's a presentation sister, and she sent a group of sisters to come and help Mrs. Smith here. And uh, it is told to us that uh, these sisters were very young sisters, aged 15, 16, 17, and they traveled the rough seas to land on the shores of Madras. St. Columbans was the first presentation convent to be established here in Chennai and that happened in 1842. With that 4B bus I yet remember, how it was crowded with all us in Mary's School, Ivo Madden and Peter Kelly, Rodney Maples, all these very fond memories it brings back. And even when it going back to Lord, that bus from Egbert used to go to Paris. So it was a two-way traffic. 
people used to uh, students used to come from Royal Royal Purim as well as from Ekbod used to get on and get on at parties, and the bus is yet running. <laughs> Phobia. And where the girls used to go to? Girls used to go to St. Clement. They are called coloured bombs even till today. <laughs> the school has a small campus, but has still managed to produce a Rochel McFarlane, presently India's top triple jumper. For many, the place is endearing because of the presence of Sister Isabella, a Goan nun who has been a church and hall decorator for hundreds of Anglonian weddings, including mine. We stopped by the convent hoping to say hello on a Sunday afternoon, but realized it was not the right time. I studied in St. Columbans, so at that time we had a lot of Anglonian teachers there, especially the junior school. To name a few, we had uh, Mrs. Vidros, Mrs. Allen, uh, Mrs. Teresita Martin, Mrs. Sequera. That's about how much I could remember. And who's left with you now? With now, uh, right now it's uh, Roberta Doggett from Madhavaram. She's taking her VRS. And then we have one more Nicola Peters and myself. Do children look up to you differently if you're an Anglonian teacher? Do they expect something different from you? Yes, more than the children, the parents. And I always think, though our counterparts are educated and you know, they go a long way in life, but I think the English and the, the education, the moulding that comes from the Anglo-Indians is matchless. I popped the question to a teacher of a Cambridge certificate school. Do the parents recognize that you're an Anglo Indian and of expect course. anything more from yeah, you? Yeah, they want like, uh, <laughs> I, I hate to talk about myself, but uh, uh, they all fight to put their children in my class. Even though now I've moved up as a, as a coordinator. And what is the case at a typically Anglo Indian school like Dufton? A lot of the uh, graduate and postgraduate uh, people in our community uh, opt for other professions uh, other than teaching Ooh. but the primary that I'm happy about that the the foundation is firm foundation is solid and we have um, about 90 percent another institution of prominence in Georgetown has been the FX school which runs the only Catholic boarding school for Anglonian girls in the city today. We spoke to a former student. We used to bully our Hindu children and all of them, all our friends from there, and we used to say, we are Anglos, we are the boss. We used to do as we say. Because they used, to, they used to catch us for folding our socks, and then we used to catch them for singing. So we used to boss them when it comes to certain things when we were, you know, leaders of. So we, I, I remember all those times and I still keep laughing at those times. Why are you not called Don and Frank School? What's the reason? I have no clue. I think maybe because they used to serve so, yeah. buns and plantains as breakfast oh, like for the boarders before I went there. But when I went there it was bread because I kept wondering why bun and plantains when we are getting bread. And I never saw plantains also, it was only buns. Okay. I mean bread with the, some kind of a curry. The FX girls often excelled at the march past in inter-school sports. We used to have it in that uh, Rajanathalam stadium. We used to always practice uh, a lot of things over there. And march past was one important thing that we were instructed to come and get the cup. Get the cup. We were just, we just did our best and we used to get it. But practicing for that, I do remember a lot of, lot of practices for that. And who could ever forget AJ D'Souza? and the Don Bosco Athletic Club. Fond memories of uh, CJ and uh, his uncle AJ D'Souza who trained us, Subramaniam, uh, Arnold Seto and quite a few others. And one of my athletes that I look upon is Marcus Doyle who was a very good athlete. Such as uh, running as well as uh, uh, field events where I got the best athlete in 1964. But right from 1959 I've been taking part. And uh, not alone in school, uh, in college I got the best athlete, in the state I got the best athlete, as well as in the university, especially to Mr. Edmonds and my friend AJ de Souza, who made this, who was the founder of the Don Bosco's Athletic Club. 
he, was, he used to come in the morning. So we used to go to law college grounds at 7 o'clock. 7 to 8.30 we used to train there. As a student, for, for three camps I attended in Kovlom for three to four days and used to sleep on the beach. We used to do a lot of running and weightlifting and etc. There's a lot of spirit to code there. Okay, and you remember any prominent sports men yeah. or sports women? Yes, yeah. Robert David uh, from St. Beat School, then one Jyoti Ram and he just lately expired. They all joined State Bank, Errol Mitchell and John, uh, Johnny they used to call him, from Madurai he was. Rodney Farmer, all these were very good athletes. All of those times people knew AJ D'Souza and he had this Don Bosco Athletic Club which, which made history. It was this huge big team, we had yellow t-shirts and red track pants and the, the whole team would come in and light up the stadium, it was like that. And the moment the team came, everyone would say, oh, the Don Bosco team has come and we would like swipe off so many medals and certificates. So. She is not exaggerating. We could all vouch for that. I think I was lucky to be at that time training under Don, uh, in the Don Bosco You had other team. Iron Indians in that team? Oh yeah, I think majority, Ricardo Ferrier, Monica Fernandez and Praveen Fernandez. So we had lots of uh, Anglo Indians there at that time and they all excelled. But back to FX school. You remember any famous Anglonian sportsman during your time, sportswoman? Yes, Isabella, Isabella Cancesso. She was pretty, I think she's a PT teacher now for FX. Also present in the school is an Anglo-Indian nun, Sister Dorothy Gomes. Some may remember the Salesian priest, Father Clive Hurley, who hailed from Georgetown and was a popular family and psychological counsellor four decades ago. Other Anglonians in the Salesian order are Father Cedric Bout, who turned 100 years recently, Father Lionel Xavier and Father Dominic Matthews. In the past, several Anglonians gave themselves up to a life of religious calling in the established orders, but hardly any more. Independent churches have become increasingly popular in the city today and many Anglo-Indians have been drawn towards them. Which church do you go to? I go to A.G.'s church. Uh because I believe in the Holy Spirit, it works very powerfully in us. Okay, at Little Mountain? Yes, outside of it. Okay, and uh, are you active in, in the church? Yeah, I was, uh, for 13 years I was a volunteer in Jesus Calls, as a prayer warrior, my wife and I. And you see a lot of miracles occur. They're just a manifestation of God's Holy Spirit in flesh and blood. Besides this, independent Anglo-Indian preachers, such as Jeffrey Faraday, David Robson, David Taylor, and David Shrimpton, to name a few, are sought after by the wider Indian Christian community. But this again is another story. Here at St. Francis Xavier's Church in Broadway, we chanced upon Dennis Andrews. In the 70s and 80s, there was, there was about more than 200 to 250 people who have stayed here, families. But now we have just 20 to 25 families here. These figures are optimistic and include neighbouring Roypuram and Eno. The fact is, Anglo-Indians have almost disappeared from Georgetown, much like the sparrows of the city. <laughs>